Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace. This is a podcast style show where we take a big topic and we break it up into a bunch of chunks so we all get it a little bit better. And today we are talking about a giant thing, the internet. Yesterday we talked about what the internet is and how data gets from you to the computers on the internet and back again. We also talked about how Al Gore didn't invent the internet, so make sure you check that out. But today we're going to talk about how deep the rabbit hole really goes. So how big is the internet? It's a very difficult question to ask, actually. It's kind of impossible to know. But you can look at the biggest indexer of the internet, Google, right? Google. Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google, world's largest index of the internet. Remember, they don't create the internet. They don't make the internet. They just tell you what's out there. They're like the table of contents for the internet. And they estimated the size of the internet as roughly 5 million terabytes of data. That's a lot. It's over 5 billion gigabytes. It's a lot of data, five trillion megabytes. Are you getting this? It's a lot. Schmidt further noted that in his seven years of operations, Google has indexed roughly 200 terabytes of the internet, or about 0.004% of the total size of the internet. That's all that's on Google, 0.004%. When you go to Google, you are searching the 0.004% of the internet that Google has indexed. Isn't that crazy? It is. The internet's big. Russell Seats took estimates for the size and traffic of the entire internet and compared that to the weight of the electrons needed to move a byte of information around. This is another way to measure the size of the internet, right? A byte is a tiny piece of information. A megabyte is one million bytes. So although minuscule, individually, trillions and trillions of bytes can add up, when you take them as a group. So if you look at it this way, the internet, according to Russell Seats, weighs two ounces. <laughs> that's, that's great. I love that. I could drink the entire internet. <laughs> it's crazy. The deep web is part of the internet as well. And this is part of the reason Google hasn't indexed more than it has. Uh, the deep web is the unindexed internet. It's basically parts of the internet that tell search engines like Yahoo and Google and Bing and all of the other ones to ignore these pages. So think universities and libraries with login level access, things that are secured websites, they can't see that. That's the deep web. Or your email, those are technically websites. If you use Gmail, that's a website on Google's server that you are accessing but that's in the deep web, so that's not included in their index. There are also other websites that are just behind walls, like Facebook is pretty much most of that information is publicly available, but they tell Google not to index all of it and only index the profile pages and then get your way into the other parts. Google, Bing, and stuff, they only capture about 1% of all of the internet's pages. So just imagine how much you're not seeing that is out there. And it is available. If you had the URL, there are ways to access it. And that is how the dark web works. You've probably heard them both. The deep web, not scary. Just stuff that's unindexed. The dark web, that's part of the deep web. And it is kind of scary. This is the nocturnality of the web. It's a network that lays over the public internet, but requires specific software and configurations or authorization to access it. The most popular browser that you would need to access the deep web is Tor, which uses a virtual tunneling system that acts like a multi-layered virtual private network. You're basically creating a private and encrypted connection with a server somewhere. Everything you do on Tor is encrypted, so no one knows what you're looking at, not even the government. It's actually pretty popular in places where the government snoops on your internet usage. You can use a VPN or virtual private network, and Tor, the government can't see what you're looking at. Basically, the dark web is for users to conduct real, anonymous, untraceable interaction online, which is, basic, which is pretty much impossible. Like right now, I'm accessing Google Docs. Google knows what I'm using to access it. It knows the browser I'm using. It knows probably where I am based on my IP address. And it might even know who owns the company I'm accessing it from and have the address. All of that's information that Google just knows because I'm logged in. It's crazy. But using Tor, a lot of that is blocked. The media says that the dark web may be a haven for illegal activity, and they're pretty much right. Places where people can talk to each other without other people listening in all find their way to Tor, and that includes a bunch of illegal stuff. But let's not get into that. It's a whole other thing. The question really is, is there a limit to the internet? Could the internet become so big and unwieldy that it's not really a useful tool anymore? This is a question of 
how big the internet can get, right? The internet protocol address, or that four-sectioned number, is IP, or internet protocol, V4. So IP addresses are basically phone numbers. The DNS service looks up what the name for that phone number is, but it does it in reverse. So if I type Google, DNS looks up the IP address for Google in my area and lets me access it. I don't have to remember that Google's IP address is 75.15. whatever, whatever, whatever. Unfortunately, though, there's a limit to the number of IPv4 addresses. You know, it's only four numbers. Those four numbers mean there's a mathematical limit to that, and it's a lot, but we're not that far from hitting it. Asia ran out of IPv4 addresses in 2011. Europe ran out in 2012. North America is running out now. And last November, Salesforce, in anticipation of this, picked up over 260,000 addresses. And Microsoft spent $7.5 million in 2011 on 666,000 addresses formerly owned by a networking company, Nortel Networks, that went bankrupt. So companies that run out of their IPv4 addresses, they're not, I mean, they're not screwed, but they've been planning for this, but it's not a good place to be. Because there is something called IPv6. It adds two more groups of numbers to the end of the IP addresses. And about 9% of the internet, says Facebook's Paul Saab, is on IPv6 already. So it was designed in 1998, and it's essentially endless numbers of IP addresses. It's functionally limitless because of the number of mathematical iterations that are added by simply adding two more sections of numbers. The problem is it's kind of complicated because right now it'd be like if you have to start dialing the area code on your phone and you didn't used to. It adds a lot more numbers, but it makes things a little more complicated. But you don't have to buy a new phone. In this case, you do. You have to buy new routers, you have to get new equipment, and this is super inside baseball, you guys. But it's really cool and it's important to know because this is how the internet works and these are problems that the physical internet faces every day. It's not just type in Netflix and you go to Netflix and it magically happens. There are thousands of computers involved in this, and it's crazy. It happens all the time. So what is the potential for the internet? I mean, the media tend to focus on the internet being used for dirty, gross things. You know what I'm talking about. But we make educational videos for the internet, and millions of people share pictures of their friends and family on the internet. And people talk to each other via their phones using the internet. We watch movies. We do all sorts of things. Most of the internet is used for being social and connecting with each other. The internet is not good or bad. The internet is a tool that can be used for good or bad. And it's not just one thing. It's all of the things that humanity can be reflected digitally. That's the internet. And all of that, the good, the bad, the complicated mess that is the internet, it all takes place in a computer somewhere in the world connected through your house. It's crazy. And inside that computer that a lot of you use is a chip from our sponsor of today's episode, Intel. Having Intel inside makes for better experiences outside. So that's it for today. We have another great video coming your way tomorrow, so make sure you subscribe to Test2 Plus so you get that. And make sure that you comment down below on what you think of the internet. Maybe what's your favorite website that people don't know about? Why don't you tell us about it? I used to love homestarrunner.com. It's the best. Anyway, thanks for watching Test2 Plus, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>